True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Tiso Blackstar Group, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live, and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Tiso Blackstar Group or its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and this is episode 11, The Shoelace Killer. Today's case was brought to my attention by listeners Roxy Piper and Lee both. I say today's case, but technically it's two cases involving the same perpetrator. The second of these cases only very recently had its day in court. We've discussed the effectiveness of the judicial system in South Africa quite a bit, and in some of the cases we've covered so far, we've certainly seen some excellent investigative work and effective sentences. This story is a little bit different, as it highlights what is perhaps the ineffective handling of younger offenders. While the perpetrator in this case was not technically a minor when he committed his first offence, I think the evidence will show that he may have received less harsh treatment due to his age the first time round, which led to a ripple effect of damage to many lives. I'll let you decide for yourself though, because it's a pretty complex situation. So let's get into the case, um, cases of the shoelace killer. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. On the 28th of February 2003, two friends, 21-year-old Jakub Strauss and 18-year-old Wesley Julian, set out for a night of partying. Travelling between bars, clubs and pubs in Mtualume, on the south coast of KwaZulu-Natal, the pair were drinking significant amounts of alcohol and allegedly consumed ecstasy and smoked dacha. Around midnight... Their car broke down, and they walked to a nearby petrol station to try and find help. At the petrol station, they met an older man, 51-year-old Kenneth Van Art. Van Art had been stopped at the petrol station to buy a few things at the convenience shop when Jakub Strauss and Wesley Julian approached him. They explained to Kenneth that their car had broken down, and asked if he could give them a lift home. Wesley Julian lived in a house in Mtualume with his parents, brother and sister. The area is about 90 kilometers from Durban, and Wesley's parents' home, at the time, was set in a large plot of open land, surrounded by the dense bush and greenery, for which KwaZulu-Natal is well known. Kenneth agreed to help them, and they all piled into his vehicle, a Ford Icon. At some point, it was decided that before dropping off the pair at home, Kenneth would take them for drinks at the Mtualume Social Club. They arrived there shortly before 1 o'clock in the morning, on the 1st of March, and stayed there until about 2.30, when Strauss would later say that he and Julian had helped Kenneth out to the vehicle because he was intoxicated and found it difficult to walk. Jakub Strauss got behind the wheel of the Ford Icon with Kenneth in the passenger seat and Wesley Julian sitting in the back. It is unknown what truly sparked the events which would soon follow, but in a statement, Jakub Strauss claims that as they were driving on the N2 highway near Park Rainey, Wesley Julian, seated behind Kenneth Van Art, suddenly piped up and told Strauss that he was going to strangle Kenneth. He then hooked his arm around Kenneth's neck from behind and began to attempt to strangle him. Strauss claims that he was shocked 
and slowed the vehicle down, eventually pulling over to the side of the road. He says he got out of the car and paced beside it as Wesley continued to strangle Kenneth. Wesley then called out to Strauss to give him one of his shoelaces as he was finding it difficult to strangle the man. Strauss claimed that although he was shocked, he complied and pulled one of his shoelaces from his shoe and handed it to Wesley, who proceeded to wrap it around Kenneth's neck. Strauss watched as Wesley strangled Kenneth to death. Wesley then told Strauss to check the man's pulse, which he did, and found that he was dead. Strauss claims to have asked Wesley, Do you realise what you've done? To which Wesley Julian allegedly replied, So what? Strauss got back into the car, and the pair continued on to Wesley's parents' home, they decided to dispose of Kenneth's body in an open plot of land near Wesley's home. After carrying the body onto the piece of land, Wesley entered his parents' home and returned to the body with the roll of packaging tape. He tightly wound the packaging tape around Kenneth's head and face, ensuring that his mouth and nostrils were covered. The pair then covered the body with branches and set off again in their victim's car. They drove to Durban, where they unsuccessfully tried to sell Kenneth's car. They then returned home around six o'clock in the morning and fell asleep. Later that day, they tried again to sell the vehicle, but when they failed, they wiped it down to remove any fingerprints and abandoned the car in Scottsboro. They returned to the body and decided to bury it instead to avoid the smell of decomposition alerting anyone to its presence. Strauss would later explain that they had dug a relatively shallow grave and rolled Kenneth's body into it. When they did so, 70 rand fell out of his pocket. Strauss alleges that Wesley took 50 rand for himself and gave Strauss 20 rand. Kenneth van Aert's wife, Sharon, reported him missing when he didn't return home on the 1st of March. His vehicle was found abandoned, but nothing in it yielded any clue to the man's whereabouts. Sharon van Aert would spend another 68 days wondering what had become of her husband before the truth about his demise emerged. Wesley Julian carried on with his life in those two months. He seemingly showed no signs that anything untoward had happened. His friend Jaku Strauss, though, was having a more difficult time of it. A few months before the murder, the wife of one of Yaku's friends had come to visit from the UK. The woman's husband and Yaku had been school friends and were seemingly very close. Yaku's friend didn't accompany his wife on the trip to South Africa, but Yaku met up with her during her holiday. Yaku had an affair with the woman, which lasted throughout her holiday in South Africa. After she returned to the UK, it seems the pair stayed in touch through SMS messages. After the murder, seemingly filled with guilt, Yaku Strauss sent a barrage of messages to the woman between the 1st of March and the 3rd of March. In these messages, he confessed to having been involved in a murder. In one message, he told the woman, quote, It was terrible burying this guy. He was ice cold and so white. They're going to be looking for him now. I'm so scared. End quote. The messages were detailed and clearly disturbing, as not long after having received them, the woman reported the messages to the police in the UK. British police contacted Interpol, who in turn contacted South African police. Jaku Strauss was tracked down and arrested. Strauss would enter into a plea deal with prosecutors in exchange for testifying against Wesley Julian. Wesley was arrested shortly afterwards. Julian told a very different tale to his friend, and in it, all the events were directed by Jakub Strauss. 
and Wesley was simply doing what he was told. He claimed that while they were driving, Yakua told him that if he wanted to make 10,000 rand, all he had to do was listen to him. Wesley claimed that all he had done was restrain Kenneth Van Aert, and Yaku had been the one to remove his shoelace and strangle him with it. Wesley also claimed that Yaku had told him that he must wrap Van Aert's face with packaging tape because he didn't want to see it. Yaku allegedly instructed Wesley to stamp on the grave of Van Aert to compress the sand so that it didn't look obvious that the ground had been disturbed. Wesley said that he had told Yaku that they couldn't just leave him there and they should say a prayer for him at least. The two then argued about who was going to say the prayer before Yaku blurted out, Dear God, please forgive us and let him rest in peace. The case became well known in the UK as the SMS murder. In 2004, due to his plea deal, Yaku Strauss was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. Wesley Julian was also found guilty, but mitigating evidence presented by his defence counsel regarding psychological assessment was accepted by the judge, and he was sentenced to just 13 years in prison. During his court-ordered psychological assessment, Wesley Julian had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Psychologists, however, had testified that while this condition may have played a role in the crime, as Julian was young, there was a good possibility he could be rehabilitated through therapy. The family of the victim, as well as the prosecution team, were outraged at the light sentence. They would later successfully appeal the sentence, and it would be increased to 20 years. Although an apparent victory for justice at the time, this appeal would actually end up making absolutely no difference. As in 2009, after serving just five years in prison, Wesley Julian was released on parole. His accomplice, Yaku Strauss, was released on parole the following year, after serving six years of his sentence. Now, examining the way the murder went down, I would think that it, it would have been difficult to determine who was really responsible for Kenneth Van Aert's murder. Due to the nature of the crime, it would have been almost impossible to say exactly whose hands held the shoelace that killed Kenneth. In both accounts, Wesley Julian restrains Kenneth, so we know at least that much is true. The question lies in whether Yaku took the shoelace off and handed it over to Wesley, or whether he used it on the victim himself. There's really little else that makes one more seemingly culpable than the other. The only difference between them is that Yaku seemed to show remorse, and of course managed to secure a plea deal, and Wesley didn't. So from a sentencing perspective, it would make sense for Wesley to have received a higher sentence, depending on what deal Yaku had struck with the prosecutor. In my opinion, the 13 years was insufficient, and the 20 years may have been more realistic. The judge probably would have taken into account that Wesley was a first-time offender, with no previous history of being in trouble with the law, that we know of, he may have taken his age into account, and we know that he did take his psychological diagnosis and opportunity for rehabilitation into account. So maybe we can understand the sentence. The decision to parole is a tougher one, though. I found a short article written by Neo Madlala of Fachuane Heni Attorneys, which I will link in the show notes. The article discusses how parole works in South Africa and is quite enlightening. Essentially, the possibility of parole is determined at sentencing. When the judge passes sentence, he'll usually indicate if he wishes for a specific period to be served before the convict is allowed to apply for parole. If they don't specify a non-parole period, 
Then the prisoner is allowed to apply for parole after they've served half their sentence. This is great information, but it still doesn't explain how Wesley Julian was put on parole after serving five years. Five years was not even half of his original sentence of 13 years, and only a quarter of his increased sentence. I did find another law article which stated that because parole laws have changed so many times in the last two decades, correctional staff, prisoners and even some parole board members are finding it difficult to determine which rules apply to which prisoners. The article confirms that mistakes have been made in issuing parole to offenders because of this. Is this what happened here? Was Wesley Julian granted parole erroneously? Honestly, I doubt it, and I'm assuming that there must be a loophole that I'm not seeing here. This entire process, though, is just to get you to the point of applying to the parole board, and that is a process on its own. After an offender is granted leave to apply, the parole board considers their conduct in prison, they'll receive reports on their progress from correctional staff, as well as updated psychological analyses if applicable. The process is supposed to require consultation with the victim or victim's family as well, but I know that this doesn't always happen. Parole is of course not an end to your sentence. The remainder of the sentence still exists on record and parole conditions are set which govern the offender's behaviour while on parole. If the offender is found to have breached the conditions of their parole, they'll be sent back to prison to serve the remainder of their sentence. Parole conditions will usually be specific to the offender's crime, but will also include some general restrictions such as not involving themselves in any criminal activity. A sex offender, for instance, may be restricted from living within a certain distance of children, and they'd be prohibited from working with children. Parolees are required to have a fixed address and seek employment. They're also forbidden from abusing drugs and alcohol. I can only assume that Kenneth Van Aert's family were not happy with these men serving such a small portion of their sentences, but his wife Sharon did meet with Jakustras' parents while they were still incarcerated, and indicated to them that she'd forgiven the men. The crime was heinous, to be honest, especially for two boys from decent backgrounds, and considering they essentially ended Kenneth's life for 70 rand. Either way, Wesley Julian was a free man in 2009. Jakustras followed the next year, claiming to have given his life to religion. There's no indication that the men ever had contact, again, outside of prison, and Jakustras seems to have blended back into society without much upheaval. Wesley, too, seemingly lived the next eight years quite normally. There are photographs online of him spending time with his sister Jody and brother Jeffrey. The three unfortunately lost their mother during this time, and their father Clive went to live in Plettenberg Bay. The three Julian siblings lived their lives, with older brother Geoffrey marrying his girlfriend, Leanne McKenna. The family house in Mtualume, near which Kenneth van Aert's body had been buried in 2003, remained in the family throughout this time, with the siblings alternating between living in it individually and elsewhere. By 2017, Wesley's father had decided to sell the property. Jeffrey, Wesley's older brother, was living elsewhere with his wife Leanne, his nine-year-old son Ethan, 16-year-old stepdaughter Kayla, and his father-in-law Peter. Wesley was staying at the Mtualume property while the sale was in progress and it is alleged that on the 19th of December 2017, Wesley noticed that a few pieces of furniture were missing from the house. He is said to have phoned his brother Geoffrey 
and questioned him about the furniture. Jeffrey had said that he did have the furniture, and after a verbal disagreement, he agreed to return the items to Wesley at the family home. It was school holidays, so Jeffrey took his children and father-in-law with him to the house. Jeffrey was due to fetch his wife Leanne from work at quarter to five in the afternoon, and when he didn't arrive to collect her, Leanne said that she knew something was wrong. Jeffrey was always punctual, and she could always reach him on his cell phone. His cell phone rang without being answered, as did her daughter Kayla's and her father's cell phone. Leanne eventually managed to get home, only to find the house empty. Less than two hours later, Leanne Julian received a terrifying telephone call. Her parents-in-law's house in Tualume was on fire. Neighbours had seen the flames around 7pm and gathered to try and put out the flames. Their efforts had been in vain, though as by the time the fire department managed to douse the flames, four bodies had been discovered in the bedroom of the house. First responders were glad to find at least one survivor. He was outside when the neighbours arrived, coughing, seemingly overcome by smoke. It was Wesley Julian. Leanne was initially told that her entire family had been asleep when the fire started. This did not make sense to her, as they didn't live at the house, and Jeffrey was supposed to have picked her up from work. As investigators started to gather information from Leanne, and the bodies were examined, a far darker picture emerged. Leanne had indeed lost her entire family. Jeffrey, Ethan, Kayla, and her father Peter were all dead but they hadn't been asleep when they had died. They'd been strangled to death. It didn't take long for police to put the picture together. When neighbours that had attended the scene first were interviewed, they stated that Wesley had been behaving strangely in their opinion. He hadn't made any attempts to assist in putting out the fire and was consistently vague when questioned about whether there was anyone in the house. There is an allegation, but I will say that I only saw this in one place, that he had cut the hose pipe that a neighbour was using to try and put the flames out. Wesley had been taken to hospital to be treated for smoke inhalation. He was discharged the next morning and taken in by police for questioning. He denied any knowledge of the circumstances which had led up to his family's death. He claimed that he had just returned to the house and found it on fire. He'd run inside, but had become overcome by the smoke and had to leave. When asked why he hadn't called emergency services, he responded that everything happened so quickly that the neighbours were already there by the time he got outside, and they said that they had called. He had said that he had no idea that his family was still inside the house until he was told, while in hospital, that they had all died. He also denied having tried to thwart the neighbours' attempts to put out the fire. Wesley was released, and after his family members were laid to rest on the 28th of December, he moved to Plettenberg Bay to live with his father. The investigation continued, though, and Wesley's cell phone records told a different story about his movements that day than he had. He had claimed that he'd left the house and returned to find it ablaze. His cell phone record showed that he was at the house in Mtualume the entire afternoon from the time his family was estimated to have arrived. His cell phone records also showed that at the time he claimed to be overcome with smoke and shock, he was in fact texting his girlfriend in America, telling her that his home was on fire. Then the autopsy reports came back for the four victims. 
34-year-old Jeffrey Julian had been attacked first. He'd been hit in the head with a pickaxe and then strangled to death with a rope. His father-in-law, 73-year-old Peter McKenna, had been strangled with a ligature made from copper wire. The children had been killed last. 16-year-old Kayla McKenna had been strangled with a dog collar and some green rope, while her brother, 9-year-old Ethan, had also been strangled with an unidentified ligature. They'd all been killed in different areas of the house and then dragged into the room where they had been found, creating the initial misconception that they'd been asleep. The house had then been doused in petrol and set alight. Wesley Julian was arrested on four counts of murder just a few days before his 33rd birthday at his father's home in Plettenberg Bay. Police believe that the so-called shoelace killer, who had been so infamous in his teens after killing Kenneth Van Aert, had struck again, this time much closer to home. Wesley appeared in court for the first time shortly after his arrest. He appeared tired and drowsy and could barely communicate with magistrates. He applied for legal aid. Wesley pleaded not guilty to all the charges against him and he was sent to Fort Napier for a psychiatric examination. He was found fit to stand trial. The state's case against Wesley was largely circumstantial, which even state advocate Dorian Paver admitted to the judge at the outset. There were no eyewitnesses that could attest to seeing Wesley kill his family members or set the fire. Circumstantial evidence can sometimes be seen as weaker than physical evidence, but when there is a mountain of circumstantial evidence and it all points in one direction, that can sometimes make for a more compelling case than just a few pieces of isolated physical evidence. When the trial of Wesley Julian started in 2018, a very different young man stood accused than the one who had stood trial for murder 14 years before. The 18-year-old Wesley had been nervous, fidgety and unsure of himself, Now a man, seasoned in the justice system, having spent time in prison, Wesley was described as almost arrogant. The state's case was that Wesley had been fighting with his brother Jeffrey over the missing furniture for some time. Wesley had felt that Jeffrey had removed items from the house which should have been his without consent. The state believes that even though Jeffrey had agreed to return the items, The argument had continued when the family arrived at the house, and it had escalated into a physical attack on Jeffrey by Wesley with the pickaxe. When Wesley realised that his brother was dead, the state claims, he knew that he had to kill the others too, so he moved from person to person, taking out the strongest first, the two adult men, and then moving on to his niece and nephew. The state believed that he had doused the contents of the house in petrol and set it alight just before 7pm. Perhaps he had been trying to set further fires to increase the damage when he had unexpectedly become overcome by smoke and been forced to leave the premises, meeting the approaching neighbours as he exited. Under cross-examination by state advocate Dorian Paver, Wesley had to be asked on more than one occasion not to mumble. When he was speaking, he spent more time asking questions than answering them. Every time Paver posed a certain set of circumstances to him, Wesley would ask how it could possibly have happened like that. Wesley said that he had argued with his brother the day before the murders, but on the day he had died, they had already settled their differences. He often responded to questions by smiling and laughing at the prosecutor until eventually the judge had to intervene and instruct him to just answer the questions plainly and without the theatrics. 
the states presented evidence that the keys to Jeffrey's company car had been found in Wesley's possession. Wesley had responded that his brother had given him his car keys. This totally blew his initial claim that he didn't know his family was in the burning house out of the water. Jeffrey's car was parked outside. Wesley had no doubt taken the car keys from his brother's body and been on the way to flee in the vehicle when the response of neighbours had thwarted his plan. It also emerged that Wesley's girlfriend, who was in America at the time of the incident, had called him just before the neighbours had seen the flames coming out of the house. Wesley hadn't answered the phone call, but he had sent text messages to her as soon as he walked out of the house. It was alleged that Wesley and his girlfriend were going to move in together when she returned from America. She had apparently also been badgering him to make sure he got the furniture back from Jeffrey so that they could furnish their new home together with it. State advocate Dorian Paver put it to Wesley that between the argument with Jeffrey, the indignation he felt at the furniture having been taken, and his girlfriend's badgering to sort the situation out, Wesley had snapped, and in Paver's words, the demons got to you. At hearing this, Wesley leaned back in his chair and laughed, mocking Paver. He said, Sure, the demons got to me. Wesley had to be reminded that the matter in discussion was the brutal murder of four of his own family members, including two minor children. Despite there being no physical evidence to prove that Wesley murdered his family, I do feel that the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. The murders did not present as a robbery. Nothing was taken from the house and there was no evidence that anyone other than Wesley had been present with the victims at the scene. It is a pretty amazing feat for one person to have killed four people, but I guess it's not impossible. If the children were outside when the adults were killed, perhaps Ethan wanted to explore the bush area around the house and Kayla had accompanied him, Wesley could have isolated Jeffrey in one room of the house, out of view of Peter, and killed him, then moved on to Peter, who would have been caught unaware and probably easily overpowered by the younger man. The children would have come back into the house with no idea of the horror that was unfolding and been attacked then. It is a mystery how he managed to stop one child from running away while he was strangling the other child, unless he locked them in a room. I'd like to hear your theories on this aspect. Do you think it's possible for Wesley to have controlled and killed all four people? please weigh in on our social media forums with your comments. I will say that one article written very soon after the murders, before Wesley was even acknowledged as a suspect, stated that two people had escaped the blaze and were outside when the neighbours arrived. Honestly, I don't put much weight in articles that come out within hours of an incident happening, Journalists are pressed to publish something and the facts often get skewed or are not checked properly before being published. I haven't seen the presence of a second person discussed anywhere else and I'm pretty sure if Wesley had someone to either back up his story or even to lay blame on, he would have done so. Ultimately, in February this year, Wesley Julian was found guilty of the murders and he was sentenced to four life sentences, plus an additional five years for the arson. In her victim impact statement, Sharon McKenna, Leanne's sister, explained how each of the victims will be uniquely missed. Quote, Jeffrey Sean Julian, my brother-in-law, was a good man who enjoyed spending weekends with his family, taking them out or just staying at home. His children looked up to him as a role model, and it was never too much trouble to drop or fetch Kayla at the movies or at her friends' houses. My niece, Kayla McKenna, was going to grade 11 at Port Shepstone High. She was a popular girl, 
who didn't live by what others thought or did. She was an excellent example of what a perfect teenager should be. Her passions were music and cooking in the evenings alongside her mom, Leanne. Kayla was the most beautiful soul inside and out. God has really gained an angel with our loss. Ethan Julian, my nephew, was a fun-loving, lively little boy who could make anyone laugh. He loved staying at home and playing games with his cousin, with whom he was so close he called him brother. My dad, Peter Eugene McKenna, was the most amazing example to us, Leanne the eldest, me and our younger brother Ryan. He was a godly man who lived for his family and had unbelievably unconditional love for my mom, Jeanette. They were married for over 42 years. He taught us right from wrong and was known by all as a gentleman. End quote. Leanne described to the court what it felt like when she found out that her entire family had been wiped out. Quote, when I was told that there were four dead bodies inside the house, I dropped to the floor in shock and became hysterical. It was the most unbelievable thing I had ever heard. My precious children, who were my life, my everything, were dead. My life now means nothing. End quote. Leanne recounted how six days after her family was so viciously taken from her, she had to endure Christmas. She had already bought presents for her children and husband, and now they will forever remain unopened. While absolutely nothing can excuse or even explain the horrifying route that Wesley Julian decided to take with his life, I did find it interesting that he had a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, or BPD, during his first trial and I wanted to delve into that subject a bit more to see if any of the behaviours that stem from that disorder resonate with his crime. Before I get into this section, please keep in mind that I am not a psychologist. I am simply looking at the case at hand in conjunction with some research that I've done. For a definition, I am going to quote directly from a US National Institute of Mental Health website, which I will link in the sources section on our website. Quote, Borderline personality disorder is an illness marked by an ongoing pattern of varying moods, self-image and behavior. These symptoms often result in impulsive actions and problems in relationships. People with borderline personality disorder may experience intense episodes of anger, depression and anxiety that can last from a few hours to a few days, end quote. There's a whole list of signs or symptoms that can point to BPD, but there are a few on the list that stand out to me in Wesley's case. The first is that BPD sufferers will often experience a pattern of intense and unstable relationships with family, friends and loved ones often swinging from extreme closeness and love to extreme dislike or anger. Is this possibly an example of what we saw between Wesley and his brother, who would eventually become his victim? Of course, we don't know the history between the brothers before the furniture incident, but it certainly seems very odd to have generated enough anger to physically harm your own brother over some furniture which he was returning anyway. Another known behavioural indicator of BPD is impulsive and often dangerous behaviours, such as spending sprees, unsafe sex, substance abuse, reckless driving and binge eating. These behaviours can also be symptoms of certain mood disorders, so it cannot be viewed in isolation. We don't know much about Wesley's behaviour in the eight years that he was out of jail, but he was certainly exhibiting these behaviours when he committed his first murder. 
The last three symptoms of BPD, which I really find to be evident in the second murders, include inappropriate intense anger or problems controlling anger, difficulty trusting, which is accompanied by irrational fears of a person's real intentions and feelings of dissociation, and feelings of dissociation like being cut off from yourself, feeling as though you're outside your body or that events are not real. Could this partially be behind how Wesley turned the act of his brother removing furniture from the house into a personal slight worth killing over? Perhaps in Wesley's mind, there was more behind his brother's action than just taking furniture that he believed didn't belong to him. If he was able to build up that act in his mind into a conspiracy by his brother to undermine him or even take something more valuable from him, perhaps that could have been enough to spark that irrational anger. The feelings of disassociation may explain his ability to behave completely calmly at the scene of the fire, although let us remember that he was still behaving with intent in trying to thwart the efforts to put out the fire. He definitely wasn't delusional. But perhaps that disassociation is what kicked in when he was killing his family. Other infamous BPD sufferers include Eileen Warnos and Jeffrey Dahmer. While this disorder may have contributed to the thinking and ability to commit the crimes, the fact remains that hundreds of thousands of other people also suffer from BPD, but they don't commit their first murder at 18 and then go on to slaughter four family members, including two children. Wesley would have received therapy during his first prison stint. He would have learned coping mechanisms. While there is currently no medication to treat BPD, therapy has been highly successful in treating patients. As an aside, I was listening to a podcast I love called Crimes Unlimited. The hosts are all highly qualified in forensic psychology fields, and the episode was about violent female offenders. Interestingly, my research showed that the majority of diagnosed BPD patients are female. The guest was talking about an American female murderer she interviewed called Jody Arias. For those of you who follow American True Crime, you may be familiar with her. She murdered her boyfriend after a very bizarre relationship, and the murder itself was also extremely heinous, with her having taken photographs of his dead body. So, on Crimes Unlimited, they discussed the fact that Jody Arias has BPD, and they made an interesting connection between BPD and domestic homicides which really rang true for me in Wesley's case as well. There's also a discussion about how BPD patients are known to develop odd attachments to people and then very suddenly swing in the opposite direction of hating them intensely for some perceived rebuff or unfair action. All of these were evident in the Jody Arias case, and I believe that they were all evident in Wesley's case as well. I'll leave a link to that Crimes Unlimited episode in the show notes. I highly recommend you give it a listen. As I said, I don't know what Wesley did in the eight years between his first parole and the last murders. Perhaps he lived the most wonderful saintly life and did his best to get himself back on track. From where we found him when he ended up murdering his family, though, I somehow doubt this. He didn't appear to have a job. He had a girlfriend, but I don't know that it sounded like the healthiest relationship on earth if she was writing him about furniture that didn't even belong to her. He clearly didn't have a place to stay because he was living at his parents' house, which was in the process of being sold. And then when that was no longer an option, he moved in with his dad. Now, I'm not for a minute saying that someone who is still struggling at 33 years old has anything wrong with them, but this goes deeper than that. You would think that after everything he put his parents and siblings through in his teens, he would want to work hard, 
not to be a burden on them. But that doesn't seem to have been very important to Wesley. Instead, he was so fixated on a few pieces of furniture that he slaughtered four of his family members, leaving his father, sister, and sister-in-law alone and shattered. Can we blame the parole system for this? Maybe partially, but they let Jakub Strauss go too, and he hasn't killed anyone else, as far as we know. In my opinion, it certainly isn't fair to allow someone to only serve five years of a 20-year sentence, when the crime is as serious as a murder. I'll continue researching the parole decision on this case, and if I come up with anything new, I'll update you in a Spotlight episode. Whatever the reasons or circumstances, five people lost their lives to this man. Kenneth Van Aert, Jeffrey Julian, Ethan Julian, Kayla McKenna, and Peter McKenna were all beloved people. They were all human beings, whose lives were not Wesley Julian's to take, and yet he did. Perhaps we can comfort ourselves with the knowledge that he will never do it again. Thank you so much for listening to episode 11, The Shoelace Killer. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to follow us on the podcatcher you use and also on our social media platforms where we discuss the cases that we cover. We're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. <music>